Right, so we, we, we delayed. So, for all the, for all, for all the, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. We're, flex, we're, we're flexible. <laughs> That's good. No, it was good. It was good. It was good. All right, let's see when you get to the Okay, sure thing, Ryan.
Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome to a win-win situation, Pandora listeners. Play $500 on us when you sign up as a new member only at Live Casino and Hotel. Sign up today for a free live rewards card now through June 30th, and we'll track your losses from your first visit and reimburse you up to $500 in free play only at Live Casino and Hotel. Tap to learn more or visit LiveCasinoHotel.com. At Arundel Mills, must be 21, must be a new live rewards member. Please play responsibly. For help, visit MDGamblingHelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER.
Thank <laughs> you. 
John Shaner's been listening. John Shaner. <laughs> he's been uh, he's been dialing in. That's great. Okay, folks, let me have you grab a seat. Uh First up, I want to thank our uh, our hosts from uh, Pico Energy and Exelon Company. Let's give them a hand, Bill, Colleen, staff. Wonderful. Uh, we have a we have a lot of uh, folks that put a lot of time in um, to these work groups and calls. We don't know what it is. I think we've estimated uh, close to a million dollars of in kind support through the fleet work group. So. Uh, that's a lot of people remote, you know, for every person in this room, there's probably 10 that aren't. Um, our, certainly our partners, our partnership with um, EEI and APPA and uh, NRECA has been growing with our states. We want to thank Molly, Jeff, for being here today. I know Teresa's here, Persia's on the phone. There's a lot of people involved in that, certainly. So I want to thank them. Also, I want to recognize Arcos. Uh, Jason and I have known each other for a long time. Arcos now is working with uh, the elect, has been working with Electra for a long time. And um, they sponsored the breakfast this morning, and I just want to introduce them and uh, and appreciate you guys doing that and helping the effort. So, okay, okay. Jason said he'll hold the comments. I, perfect. Okay, we'll move. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, our next panel is going to get into this afternoon. We're going to look at two panels. One is uh, the folks that are involved in this panel are going to be the core to a public-private integrated discussion around data sharing. Right? How do we move data faster? Uh, we have our SICE project running because of that meeting. Uh, Greg McShane and I at the NIC have been exchanging information. Thank you, Greg. And uh, so it's all about getting the right people to, you know, to the right data. And that's all done by use case, right? It's all grounded in use cases. That was the whole point. And this, after that, we'll talk about the ORL process that Carrie Hicks and the SICE working group have been developing for the last maybe 18 months. This is sorely needed. It's a way of helping decision maker knows what data, what tools, what things. Personally, data first is what data is reliable, what data is uh, can be operationally ready. So uh, I don't think I forgot anything else. So let me invite Chris and panels up. You know, let you guys start and do the introductions. Uh, there's microphones up there. Push the green button or little button once, and the light will turn green, and you're up and running. I just ask when you speak, put it like right next to your mouth. <laughs> okay? Huh? Yes. Go ahead. No, no, I don't. So I'm going to stand up because these are some prestigious gentlemen, and I don't want to taint that table with me sitting with the prestigious gentlemen that will be here. Um, good afternoon. My name is Chris Keldart. I'm going to uh, facilitate the panel here. Um, we're going to go through some questions for the folks up here. They're going to do some, some talking about um, this topic, and then we really wanted to make sure we had time for question and answer. So we're going to go through our piece of it. Uh, as quickly as possible up here, um, making sure we take the time we need to to cover the right things. But really, it's an interactive session. So if you have questions as we go through this, please get those questions ready because it's a, a big part of um, of what we're going to try to do up here. So the first thing um, we'll do is just go down the line on the panel. And if you would, please, gentlemen, um, say who you are, um, what you do right now, why is this conversation um, important to you, and why are you here? Okay, um, Jeff Dorco, listed up there, assistant administrator uh, for FEMA. What, what do you do? So I'm, I'm a, there's a directorate, a logistics directorate at FEMA focused on disaster logistics in the headquarters. In blue sky time, it's about 75 folks uh, who sit around and do all the preparedness stuff we need to, to be prepared for disaster. So we own distribution centers. Uh, we have uh, contingency contracts that are available. We have partners who we deal with. Uh, who have capabilities and contingency contracts, so it's all manner of readiness for disaster. Then what happens when, when a disaster is declared and the National Response Coordination Center is stood up, the 75-odd individuals, well, they're not odd individuals, the 75 individuals, yeah, you 
Jermaine, you're not odd. Uh, um, um, they all go downstairs and assume a role in the NRCC, uh, largely in the resource support section, which is a much broader mission than just kind of peacetime blue sky uh, logistics, and it becomes a, a little bit bigger. And, you know, resource support, everybody knows how – your resource support is organized, and that includes the moving control center. Jermaine operates that uh, in one of our shifts shifts for us, uh, and so we operate during disaster. So, you know, you know, what brings you to the conversation? It was probably three years ago, so I've been in log maybe almost four years now. Uh, Dave Kaufman came down and, and threw something on my desk. It was about a 75-page buff book that said, read this and then come up and see me. And so what it, what it was, it was the executive summary that Phil Palin wrote, or Phil Palin was the author of, was the Mid-Atlantic Supply Chain Study uh, that was done as a regional catastrophic planning grant effort. Uh, and, and I read that, and my eyes were opened to, you know, I'm not a, naturally a logistician, I'm just an old combat engineer out of the Army, to understand disaster logistics a, a little bit better. And if any of you have read that, I mean, it's a real eye-opener. So, Sandy, what, what it did does in a, in a way is it, it posits like a Sandy and a half and compares it to Sandy and, and looks at uh, supply chains in the Mid-Atlantic, real roughly Norfolk up to New York City. And so, for example, in, in Sandy, uh, we probably had 12 and a half million FEMA meals on all our shelves. And so Sandy comes, we launch every meal we have off the shelves. Then we turn on our contracts and we're ordering more packaged meals, halal meals, kosher meals, getting millions of MREs from, uh, from DLA out of the Marengo Caverns in Indiana. And we're doing box lunches and you name it, cereal boxes, and shove everything up the, up the street. And, and when the dust settles from Sandy, yeah, this was a loaves and fishes moment because all the extras come back and we filled up all the space we started out with on the shelves and had to go lease four extra warehouses, you know, to put everything that came back on. And, and so it leads you to think that you know, we probably didn't understand something about the supply chains out there. And as Phil points out in the study, you know, go, go look at CNS and CNS on any given week does about 20 times the, the food, you know, that the federal, state and all these contingency capabilities brought to bear over a six week period uh, for, for Sandy and, you know, CNS can ratchet up, you know, turn the rheostat up and CNS is not the only wholesaler, you know, in, in the area. So it was a real eye opener to me. So fast forward and, and I know, I know we, we know what the laundry list of questions that are coming our way are, but, but if you fast forward to the recent series of events and we talk about the supply chain stuff, we're going to talk about and our ability to interact and exchange information, uh, a whole new suite of problems, you know, en ended up in our lap where our ability to exchange information, our ability to talk, because, you know, in, in this business, it's, you know, it's not information for information's sake. Uh, you know, it, it's information to inform decision-making, because we're all part of organizations, whether we're public or private sector. We own resources, and we have authorities and capabilities, and the whole idea is how best to solve problems in doing that. That's, that's what we're trying to do at the NRCC. That's what the NBEOC is trying to solve and we only get better at this business and we only understand the whole disaster architecture out there if we can exchange the right information in a timely way. And I guess the one point, our discussions until now, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, have focused on operations. The disaster hits and how did we creatively talk and exchange information back and forth. I would like to talk a lot about private sector integration in the planning process. And, and no plan ever survives contact with a storm. That's Helmut von Moltke tweaked a little bit. And we know, you know, was Eisenhower whoever said, you know, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. I think private sector integration and plans, I mean, we can solve, you know, 50% of our problems by having thought about it ahead of time, put the appropriate relationships, agreements, contingency contracts, or whatever in place. I mean, that, that's, that's what makes me passionate about this business, because in the end, there's one measure of success, and it's taking care of disaster survivors who just had their worst day ever, and how can we do that best? And, and if we're not doing something on any given day to make that outcome better, then we're probably working on the wrong thing. And the private sector's capacity is infinite, virtually infinite, compared to anything that we can do out of our distribution centers, with DLA, with GSA, with the Corps of Engineers, or any of our federal partners. And we got to harness this. And it's all about information exchange and being able to make smart decisions to solve problems. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Jeff. Matt. Uh, the reason I'm here today is uh, because Rob Glenn and I want to take a road trip from Washington, D.C. So with, if anybody has any contacts in either the Maryland, Delaware, Philadelphia, or the, uh, the Pennsylvania State Police apparatuses, I might need a contact number because I might have broken a few traffic laws getting up here. So, uh, But uh, all is well. Um, I'm Matt Wambacher. I'm the acting director of the National Infrastructure Coordinating Center. 
And what we do during steady state is uh, we monitor uh, and report on the status of national uh, critical infrastructure of, of significance and other events that could impact national critical infrastructure. And we get into uh, an event like we did this summer, which, of course, I'm three weeks on the job when Hurricane Harvey made landfall uh, into this position, thinking, oh, well, I'm going to get a little trial by fire with this storm. Uh, four storms later and 60 days later, uh, realized that uh, it was a lot more involved. We had to uh, joint, uh, jointly work very closely with, uh, with FEMA, not only the NRCC, but the NBEOC uh, to help provide up what are those sites of uh, significant national critical infrastructure and how do we work through all of the different layers of government and with the private sector to make sure that we uh, restore and prioritize appropriately uh, to get critical infra infrastructure services restored. And that was very different from uh, Texas to Puerto Rico. And so uh, why I'm here is because we want to talk about how we do that in the future uh, and how we are working with the private sector, including that in the, in the planning apparatus uh, I've got a staff of about 60 people that maintain a 24-7 watch, planning, uh, operations, continuity of operations uh, within, within my section, all speaking towards when this bad thing happens, uh, which last summer we saw that was about 60 days long. So look forward to today's conversation, and I will uh, yield the time to Mr. Glenn. Rob. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so as Matt said, uh, um, it was a little bit like the Blues Brothers getting up here, but, um, you know, Matt and I didn't know each other uh, when we started on this uh, on this journey. So um, at that point, um, I know we're kind of doing an introduction. All right. So <clears throat> to recap, Blues Brothers, on the way from uh, D.C., we're on a mission for Tom Moran. Uh, uh, all kidding aside, uh, uh, the partnership, and I know I'm kind of doing my own introduction, but I want to also talk a little bit about these other two gentlemen. So up here, there's a very unique opportunity for us to have a conversation. So responsible for all logistics, disaster supply chain, Jeff Dorco. Responsible for coordinating across 16 sectors, Matt Wambacher. Rob Glenn, um, I kind of tie that some of those pieces together through the National BEOC. Steady State, I'm the director of the private sector division. <clears throat> and so what we do is really provide a central coordinating point for the private sector uh, before, during, and after disaster. The way that we do that in the disaster is through the mechanism of the national BEOC, which is part of the National Response Coordination Center. So uh, as, as, uh, as Jeff talked about the, the MCC and the RSS, those are also components of the uh, National Response Coordination Center. I've got the national BEOC. So um, why I'm here is to figure out what we need to do to do better uh, in, the, in the coming hurricane season uh, and also earthquake season, which is every single day. Um, and every day is a cyber, uh, cyber season. So from that standpoint, I'm really here to understand what we can do better. Uh, talk a little bit about, I think, of things that we did right over the last uh, – uh, hurricane season, but also where there might be some opportunities uh, opportunities to improve. So that's it. Okay, so th that's who we have here. Um, I had the <clears throat> distinct honor of seeing all three gentlemen um, work during the 2017 hurricane season, at least for the first two storms. Um, and, and I can truly say that from what I saw uh, on their end in FEMA um, and pushing that out, working with the private sector, which is germane to our conversation here, aside from everything else I saw them do that was pretty awesome, um, really was the attempt on a government side to integrate with the private sector as we're doing a response. More than I've seen in the past, and just a quick on my background, I started as, the, as a, a Marine a long time ago, but in this field, I started as a deputy director in Maryland uh, back in 04. Um, I was an SCS at FEMA and ran the National Capital Region Office, which Kim is running now. Um, and then I was DC's emergency manager for five years. And so I've had a lot of experience with FEMA and a lot of experience with how they work with not just the states, but with the private sector. And I can say that to this day, this was the best example that I saw of an effort to do that. So one, thank you for doing that um, in this last season. But that being said, three storms, four if you count some other things that happened, 
um, but really three hurricanes that happened during the season, large. What was for you and your job um, working with the private sector, sharing information, what was the an aha moment maybe that you had during this season? Um, and then from that, what lessons did you experience? And I, I like to use that term. These guys got, got kind of laughed at me when I said on the phone, but I know from working in government, we do a lot of lessons experienced. Eventually, we have some lessons that we've learned and done something about, um, but we have a lot of experience lessons. So what was the aha moment during the, the season? And then what did you, what's something that you experienced out of that you want to take forward as a lesson to, to be learned? Okay. So um, I guess the aha moment and, and, and the lesson learned, learned are, are, are the same. Um, but, you know, I guess the bottom line, the lesson learned, we, we did not understand to the degree we should have what was going on in private sector supply chains out there. Because, it, you know, what, what we do is we go, you know, our, our first inclination, and I'll get into the strategic plan because you signed me up, you know, from the car to talk about the strategic plan later. Yeah, the strategic plan, one of the latest strategic plan, what we've always done is lay down this federal interagency, you know, supply chain. It's a replacement supply chain. Something happens, supply chains get interrupted. There are some unmet needs out there, and we rush to put this replacement, you know, capability in place. Meanwhile, this nearly infinite capacity private sector supply chain is healing itself. It's moving along. It's trying to operate. It's trying to adjust. And, and I don't think we had had near the knowledge of what was going on that we should have. I mean, what is FEMA good at? I think FEMA is, is very good at lower 48 hurricanes hitting the southeast and the Gulf Coast, where trucks and roads all lead to the problem area. And, and, and we are a trailer transfer operation. I mean, we know how to run our you know, ISBs and and bring in trailers and cross load, tra you know, cross dock, move things on. But when we got to the Caribbean, this became a very complex, multimodal, and, and a maritime operation. I think we, we do trucks really well. I think we understand air pretty well. And maritime, you know, we weren't necessarily ready for that. I mean, we started out with a small contract with a small dollar value. Uh, and a very hand, small handful of CLINs, contract lines, that would support maritime movement in the Caribbean, and that we had to grow that by leaps and bounds to be able to keep up with the storm. And, and we didn't have a clue uh, as to what was going on because we, we didn't understand the private sector supply chain that were flowing through the same ports to meet related demands uh, that, that were going on. So it gets to this information exchange. I mean, you know, it, this, how big this and, and this storm was was unequaled. Uh, so if you look at Puerto Rico, because we're having to do this for the press and for the Hill and all, all the time. So what we did in Puerto Rico from when the storm hit in September till last month was bigger than the previous 10 years of disasters combined. It is four times bigger than Katrina. This is just what we did in Puerto Rico. We're talking sourcing over 200 million meals and, and pushing almost 300 million liters of water to go in there, which is a scope and scale that we'd never dealt with before, all now laid down in, in, in an architecture that we didn't understand. We, we, so we're, we're putting water on barges and all, and we believed that, hey, we are just soaking up all the extra liner capacity on the barges that are going in, so we're not really affecting the private sector much. We ordered extra extra barges through Crowley and Tote and Trailer Bridge to come on, take our excess capacity, and we really believed that we weren't elbowing the private sector out of any capabilities to do what they were going to do. We didn't know what the private sector capabilities were, what was in the pipeline, and what we should have been rationalizing between our two organizations because the restoration of the previously existing supply chain is a lot better than some extraordinary effort that we're going to put in place. So that's kind of the lesson learned, and, and, that, and that's what we need to build on. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I had a lot of aha moments, uh, starting with uh, why did I take this job uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty quickly on. Uh, but no, it was clear to me, it, you know, I think about a, an old friend of mine I was in the military with, and he does some safety consulting now, and he says, you know, uh, if you start, uh, you know, pointing fingers at other places, you should probably start looking at your own broken windows first. And so as I sat there and reflected on some of the things that we needed to fix, I knew that we had to take a pretty exhaustive and comprehensive approach to looking at an after action review. We came up with 100 correct, uh, corrective action items. Some of those we know we can, we can make those changes and implement before the first hurricane season, uh, the, the first day of hurricane season this year, or rather, uh, and it's going to make it 20, 30% better. And we know that it's going to take time to get to uh, where, it, where it probably should have been. And simply competing priorities, we hadn't had a bunch of storms in a number of years. And so I think that uh, my organization, we were perhaps uh, 
we weren't as well uh, exercised to uh, meet the demands of something of, of, of this scope and, and scale. So I, I was kind of like, we've got to get the job done. I can only make small operational uh, adjustments as needed because we can't start issuing new rifles in the middle of the battle to everybody and say, you know, go out and do great things. So, uh, and then just the, the pure exhaustion. Uh, you know, people running that long, those many days, that becomes a safety issue. Uh, and we just didn't have the depth of bench to, to relieve people. And I was, I, was, I was frankly worried about some of our people that were engaged in, you know, effectively around the clock operations. But, uh, you know, fortunately, they, they ended uh, and uh, things sort of uh, returned to a, a stabilized uh, environment. Every one of the storms is different. Uh, the, the biggest uh, key takeaway for me was uh, we saw examples in Puerto Rico with pharmaceuticals uh, where there are items that are critical to the rest of the world, certainly the United States, the national defense effort, whatever you, however you want to spin that, that are exclusively made in Puerto Rico. Uh, and so getting items out of a deeply devastated area that are needed in a hospital in Philadelphia or they're needed uh, for a cancer patient in Missouri uh, and, and how Seemingly, from my perspective, that was hard to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we got it done at the end of the day. There's a lot of opportunity to look at what, it, what does it mean for critical uh, supplies that are manufactured in a disaster area and getting those things off into patients in that particular example. Uh, I received a phone call on a Friday night at 10 o'clock from the chief of staff of the FDA. The chief of staff of the FDA never calls me. I didn't even know who that was. Uh, and she said, hey, I hear that you're, you can help get stuff out of Puerto Rico. And I was like, well, okay, you know, go. And uh, that kind of put us down the, the, the path where we, we, we recognize this is a big problem. Every IV that's used in the United States uh, is, uh, is almost exclusively manufactured in Puerto Rico. Um, so that there's a, you know, they have a very strong supply chain that they run, but when that's disrupted because the radar's down and it's double space VFR aircraft going into Puerto Rico and all the planes that are going in are military planes, there's not a lot of room for, for, for DHL or FedEx to get a plane in there to get 185,000 liters of uh, IV fluid out. So uh, that, that became a real big challenge. And that was, uh, you know, I think the single thing that, that, that I was happy about we were able to solve. Long answer to a short question. I'm sorry. So along those lines, I think one of the aha moments for me, uh, I, I, and I guess this is the benefit of being the last guy to talk, is there's a, a, there's a real gap of understanding between both public and private sectors, right? So when we were running the daily calls, and, and, and I think one of the aha moments was how great we are together, and I don't say that just because we're here together, but we have different authorities, different strengths, different weaknesses. Uh, but for example, collapsing a, a simple phone call saved everyone a lot of a lot of time. Um, but one of the other ahas was really about this this whole idea of, and, and Jeff talked about it in his opening was integrating the private sector into planning. So there's data that's available steady state, and what we really lacked within the government was an understanding of infrastructure and how complex it is. And then also understanding the supply chains from a steady state perspective. And so one of the things that were, and I, and I had a meeting this morning um, as well with uh, a company to try to understand um, pre-disaster, what does normal look like? And, and, and how do we move forward in developing indicators of disruption, probably small, medium, and large, just for sake of simplicity? And then what does what stabilization look like? Because we were having real-time conversations in the Puerto Rico BEOC with the carriers that Jeff just talked about, and not only the carriers, but also all the grocers, and then some of the distributors, uh, and then also some of the government officials, really trying to have some operational alignment and also operational negotiation of space and space available. And so um, I think one of the, so there's an, that, that alignment and understanding was a, a, an aha moment. What do we do with that? I think is certainly how do we make tweaks this hurricane season? I'm not, I, that's going to be like, I think almost a cultural shift to really get to, um, to, to, to better understand uh, ahead of the disaster. And, and I think one of the other items more closely at home for us within the NBEOC was, um, you know, we, we started the NBOC in 2012 uh, and we were, we staffed, uh, for example, Hurricane Matthew pretty well, uh, where we were able to do some things like, you know, do the access document that we that we work together on. But this really tested, I think, the private sector function and, and I think helped crystallize what it is and what it is not for FEMA and potentially the emergency management. So um, also earlier in the day, I found out that, you know, I think that we're 
going to be almost doubling our staff size at headquarters that will help both steady state as well as uh, uh, during the, the NBOC activation. But one of the other items I think also is how do we make sure even in placement uh, of where we are physically in the National Response Coordination Center, how do we get closer to the person that works for Matt? How do I get closer to the MCC and the RSS? How can we really make sure that we're even further integrated uh, on the government side to make sure that you know we're not asking just general questions, we're asking questions with greater specificity at the outset. And so I think that that uh, is certainly where we're headed. Okay, um, we had a bunch of other questions that we've, we've had for the panel, but I think maybe what we'll do here is we'll, we'll summarize with one question and then go to questions from the audience. So you have your fleet response working group here from the All Hazards Consortium, many folks are online as well as here in the room. What recommendations would you have or suggestions would you have for this group to engage with, help with, move forward with you all as you're going forward with your planning uh, and your efforts if you haven't already covered it? If you already covered it, that's great. Maybe a reiteration. And, uh, and, and I think, Jeff, you, you had a great line as we were talking about this panel about the Hippocratic Oath. So maybe part of that is part of that one too. Anything else you want to wrap up with in that? So recommendations for the consortium on uh, the fleet working group, and then anything you might want to wrap with. Yeah, it, it, everywhere I go, I try to tell everybody, you know, I take the Hippocratic Oath. My, my first obligation is to first do no harm. Um, I, I don't run the RSS section anymore. I'm kind of like a free agent, utility infielder. I run around trying to synchronize stuff where supply chain and resource support is involved. And where I need the help is I need to make sure I'm not screwing the private sector up from getting back online. You know, don't do any harm. And then I want, you know, I want to, you know, have a good exchange of information so we're both optimizing what we do individually. And then I want to integrate, you know, what, what you all can do, you know, in, into, the, uh, in the, into the greater plan. People ask, what keeps you up at night more than anything else? And for me, it's transportation. America has huge capabilities in the private sector. I mean, we got pretty decent capabilities up to a certain level of disaster to respond ourselves, to use the Defense Logistics Agency, to use other folks. But in the end, if we can't get it from where it is to where it needs to be, right thing to the right place at the right time, you know, that then we fail. And and so I just I love where the SICE business is going. I love what the apps do for us. And I want to have this conversation about what what can we do to give us better mutual visibility of what we're trying to do. If you go down to the port of Jacksonville, I know there are, you know, people will be nice and say, no, it was really good. It worked well. We kind of integrated. You didn't really screw us up. I mean, sure we did. I mean, we had a contract with Lipsy for a gazillions of liters of water, and we're trying to cram that stuff through the port of Jacksonville. And I know Walmart or somebody else is pushing water through, too. You know, and, and you, we need to be able to do the math to make sure that – because in the end, I mean, we had, we had a lot of leftover meals and water from this one, just like the example – uh, I used, uh, you, know, you know, from up in New York and New Jersey, and this this ability to see what's in the in the pipeline, to, to understand, to have in transit visibility of what private sector stuff is moving to what we're moving, so we can just get out of the way and let the private sector sector stuff continue to flow, or we can optimize between the two of our supply chains, the federal replacement one and the normal one that is healing and coming back, and make sure you know we can do better. I mean, if we can do that. I mean, that, that doesn't just apply to Puerto Rico because there are ports involved. Uh, you think about Cascadia, uh, you know, Cascadia, they're going to be isolated communities in a, a huge part of the country, whereas you get closer, the roads are going to get narrower and smaller and then have to be counterflowed and all. And we want to make sure we get the right thing down the right road at the right time to get it where it needs to be. So transportation keeps me awake and our ability to exchange information so we can have mutual visibility of what's going on and what's moving down the system so we can optimize it. Uh, if we can make progress in that area, then I think that's probably the single hugest thing, you know, that we can do to take care of disaster survivors in the end. Hey, Matt, if I could, before you start, Matt, I have to, one, apologize. Um, we have a panelist that is on the phone, um, and I just want to check and make sure. Walter, um, like, are you on the phone, sir? Walter? thought we had him on the phone. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. 
So I think uh, I'll actually piggyback on what Jeff said a little bit. You know, with the transportation uh, and the logistics movement, I think there was a piece where uh, we had to be able to uh, to advocate to insert uh, pieces of equipment like sell on wheels, Colts, to get down to Puerto Rico. I mean, there was a huge push. Let's get, you know, food, water, the life-saving, life-sustaining stuff. But, like, the comms are 100% out. And so if we cannot bring up some capacity and we're getting good data points from uh, the emergency support function number two saying, hey, 98% of the cell phone uh, service is out in Puerto Rico. The carrier said, hey, we will open roaming, but we need to get this gear down there uh, and getting to the point where we can insert those sort of have that conversation. We got it done. Uh, you know, I think it'd be difficult to measure and say that made a you know 28 percent improvement in X, Y or Z. But when people are now able to communicate effectively and consistently, uh, we can meet those needs. I mean, the government was in victim status. Uh, we have a guy that's stationed down U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. We couldn't find him for three days. Uh, you know, it was just it was it was bad upon bad. So I think uh, inserting some of that stuff and, you know, tough decisions, uh, trade off decisions about, OK, we're going to not put a pallet of of Exxon for a, for a cult, that was, uh, that was something we need to become better at having that conversation. And, um, and I think that um, that's kind of where I'm at on that. Rob? Jeff looks like he wants to say something. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, a couple of things uh, as far as recommendations. Uh, so after having run the national BEOC for, I don't know, uh, two months, uh, and then moving moving from D.C. down to San Juan and standing up the Puerto Rico BEOC uh, was the second time that I've actually experienced standing up a private sector coordinating capability in the middle of a disaster. The first time was in Ohio uh, when we had the derecho go through in 2012. Uh, and if any of you have looked at that, you understand you know, some of that challenge uh, where we had a power outage in Ohio of, I think, two weeks. Um, Fast forward to this job and being in Puerto Rico, uh, which was, um, you know, a challenging information sharing, operational coordination, situational awareness environment. And for me, it really underscored why every single state needs to have a functioning, you can call it a BEOC, you can call it an operational public-private partnership, uh, but it's more than just having a private sector liaison. There has to be at that level, at the state level, uh, where you're talking with those that are doing commerce within your state. Because had we had that, I think we actually would have been able to inform some of the decisions that you are making, some of the decisions that you are making to the point of like, you know, what's coming in, what's going out, what needs to come out. I think we would have had a, a much better, uh, a much better start to that, uh, to that operation. So the first recommendation is, encourage those states that do not have BEOCs to move forward in that. And the second recommendation is continue to dialogue with us at FEMA on what does that really look like. Uh, we're having some existential questions about, well, why, does, why do we have an NBEOC? That was the question my boss asked me last week. So I came up with a, I thought was a pretty good answer. Um, it, it was a pretty good answer, uh, but, but I think the answer was not good enough. And I think that what we're really driving towards is um, a real national doctrine of what this looks like, and then also how can that get replicated at the state level? As we move forward with the FEMA strategic plan, not to continue to beat on that, but I mean, Brock is not, and Brock's not kidding. He wants, you know, uh, you know, locally executed emergency management, state managed disasters, and federally enabled or nationally enabled. So, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're nationally enabling, but that can only occur if there's capability and capacity at that state level, and that's where I think the Fleet Working Group and all has consortium has a great opportunity to really work with us, but also work with the states to make that happen. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we're coming to the time where I think probably best that we take some questions if we can. So any questions for the panel? Back in the corner. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Dave Jones with Storm Center and GeoCollaborate. I was just wondering, uh, as you guys look back at the 2017 hurricane season, what, um, how would you use uh, data and information differently than you may have used it uh, before? In other words, um, you know, building upon trusted data sources so you can let that data drive your decision making. Is that something that uh, that you're looking into so you can be more uh, effective with, say, this hurricane season coming up. 
the National Weather Service issues a forecast. You see this Category 5 or 4 headed towards Puerto Rico. When you see those forecasts, can you start to act before the storm actually hits, you know, things like that? Are you, are you looking at using data to drive your decision-making more effectively? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, one, we took the data from the last storm and discovered we had far, you know, we, we didn't buy ourselves enough time with what we have forward deployed in readiness stocks on the island of Puerto Rico. So where we had five to 600,000 meals in our distribution center, we're going to go up to three and a half million. You know, we'll, we'll have probably 20 or 30 million liters of water where we had 700,000 before. We're going to buy ourselves time because in the end, we, we talked about having to make these trade-offs. It's all about adjudication. And, and if you're talking just the lower 48 with the hurricane hitting it with the power of America behind those people affected on the coast, that's checkers. And then when you get to uh, the, the Caribbean, the way it played out this last time, that's chess. But when you start thinking about the private sector, that's, that's three-dimensional chess. I mean, Jermaine's on the phone at night, and he gets a call, and you may only have one space on a barge or one space on a plane, and now it's an urban search and rescue team. Well, that's pretty darn important. That's going to save somebody's life who's buried under rubble right now. A generator, that's going to be going to a hospital where if they don't have power, somebody's going to die there. Or you think about it, you got a cult or something like that. There are certain capabilities where, man, you, you, you know, we don't know what's going on. We don't know the other 10,000 people whose lives are at risk because we can't even communicate to a huge part of the most at-risk part of the island. I mean, how do you adjudicate and figure out what that is? And right now, we don't have enough information to make the most intelligent and best decision that we can right now. So that's why SICE and the information exchange, so we can get a bigger, better picture, not that it's going to make the, the, you know, the moral decision that you got to make at the end of the road any easier, but at least you feel confident that I had all the information that I could get on this and I made the best decision I could at the time. Right now, we make a decision and we go, man, I don't even know what I don't know in some cases. So it's it's not necessarily the quality of the data, the quality. Of the, I mean, I just need more data because I know I don't have enough, so that I know that I'm making the most optimal decision. Anybody have something to add to that? One. So I think it gets also into what are the uh, you know the authoritative data sources. I mean, the NOAA weather uh, weather.gov reports. I mean, we 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 had the NOAA weather briefer for FEMA on the private sector calls every day, and I can't tell you the number of people that were very very thankful. Uh, to have that that sort of precise, this is the authoritative weather forecast, and I think you know provide advice and take a lot of questions as a result of that. Uh, but then we got into other uh, other issues with data and questions. What I would describe as almost you know, could you please boil the ocean by noon? Uh, kind of questions from 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 people that I work for. It's like, well, we're going to need a big Bunsen burner for that, but I'll, you know, we'll give it a try. And one of those was in Florida fuel. Uh, fuel for vehicles, you know, shortages on that. And um, I asked the question, well, don't we have access to the WEX data, which is the right express data that GSA has? Because, I mean, the government owns the largest fleet of vehicles in the United States, and it seems to me that we would understand where people are buying gas. And I got looked at like I was crazy. No, that doesn't exist. Uh, so we're looking at gas buddy. Well, a month ago, we're sitting in then, here's all the WEX data. I'm like, well, that would have been great to have like uh, this summer. So we don't know oftentimes what is out there uh, and we certainly cannot access it uh, with any sort of uh, agility. And, and, and that, that has to be better. Uh, and oftentimes people such as yourself have better access, not a map to and get to quicker than we do. And just to kind of close it out. So I don't know, think more is necessarily better. And so uh, one of the things I think that we don't really have is a, a solid frame of reference for using the data that we have to, 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 to Matt's point. Um, the other thing, and you talked about Gas Buddy, and we did use Gas Buddy, I think, to pretty good effect in, in coordination with the state of Florida, and even our own situation awareness section. Um, but, but one of the learnings there was, I think even in your question, Dave, you're talking about trusted data, right? There's still this thing uh, out there that, well, the only trusted data comes from the government. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case. And, and I think that for the for the directionally right decisions that we need to make, and I think industry needs to make, I think that's where we need to find um, some data substitutes that, that you're talking about, Matt, whether it's WEX data, whether it's Gas Buddy, you know, what, what really, what decision needs to be made? And, and, and I would just echo, and I think all three of us were assigned some um, impossible tasks based upon, just give me the data for X. 
and 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 I and we've got to really crystallize what decision we're trying to make and what decision we're trying to support, and then trying to figure out how best to use the data there. And I'll and I'll I'll close with this. One of the things that we did in Puerto Rico was develop a food acquisition index, and we took data from social vulnerability, uh, the social vulnerability index. We took uh, data from the mayors in the 78 municipalities. We took uh, data that that uh, that the log chief was providing, along with the grocers as well and distributors, and really trying to look at how people procured or acquired food before the disaster as a way of recognizing when the disaster was stabilizing in, in certain municipalities as well. That, to me, is probably where we really need to be going. Okay. Next question. Mr. Lockwood. We're increasingly in an interconnected world. IT systems, cyber systems, digital systems between physical, logical systems. Okay. We benchmark m multiple major regions in the U.S. Probably the most prepared from a cybersecurity major cyber event is the Seattle region. We benchmark between public, private, not-for-profit regions. There are a number of mechanisms that were outlined within that benchmark that highlighted process, integration, authority-related issues at a public and private level. One of the key issues when we went to NPPD, they constantly pushed us back over to FEMA. Yet, when we had the conversations with FEMA, we were pushed back over to NPPD. So one of the questions that I just wanted to ask to keep it really simple, because some mechanisms are up to the states to change when we talk about GMAC, there's some liability-related issues, but all that's detailed in the report. But can you talk a little bit from an IT perspective? What were some of the key things that came out of the events that you guys hit that we should think about back over from a private sector coordination perspective? So I'm not going to let Rob Glenn answer this because he was on the – phone with the IT trouble desk at FEMA when uh, we were driving up here and so uh, I'm kidding but uh, yeah. no it's a great that is a that's a fantastic question you know one of the one of the uh, sister division uh, is the is the NKIC uh, the National uh, Communication Cyber Integration Center uh, their director and, and, and I are at present working on sort of drafting a con ops that looks at joint physical and cyber response uh, doctrine taken from the unified uh, the UCG and then the sort of physical response doctrine. And we're starting to see more of these examples of uh, a cyber domain event impacting potential physical systems, Colorado ransomware event. Um, that was, you know, talking with some of our folks out there, they said, hey, you know, if the, if the air handling fans stop in this particular tunnel uh, because of that, because it is DOT systems that are impacted, uh, you are talking about major disruptions to a north-south uh, transportation corridor with uh, over-the-road uh, trucks. So it, we have got uh, a lot of work to do on that. Uh, my planning group, we're working through uh, some of the uh, some of the initial stages of that because it's not been done. Uh, I, I, I keep saying, is there an example of something that looks like this? And it does not exist in government. I know that uh, we're going to work towards that. Uh, and that is probably, I don't know, six, eight months off to have a pretty well-developed con ops. Uh, but uh, I agree with you. That is Talk about a thing that keeps me up at night is something happening in the cyber, uh, the cyber uh, domain that, that impacts physical or vice versa. That is going to be an absolute game changer. I think we don't recognize generally what that could look like. Literally, when we look at things from space weather to cyber to EM, where you would say they would all have these similar characteristics and these similar capability shortfalls and needs. Um, even when we went through DOD for reconstitution, they're not structured to address these kinds of questions. I can tell you where every principal forge and lathe is, but I can't come up with transformers for the people to install. I would love the opportunity to speak with you after this so we could uh, I could get that and I appreciate that because we need help on making sure we get this right. And thank you Tom if you could provide that uh report into um Tom that would be great. Other questions? No other questions. Okay. 
let me just do this with each panelist, just a minute wrap up, something to leave the group with. Um, to, uh, to, you know, a couple folks have talked about what keeps them up at night. I have a five-month-old that keeps me up at night. But um, just to go down the line uh, for folks, some parting comments, something to leave the audience with that you think um, would be beneficial. Uh, I'll just, you know, you know a sales pitch for the FEMA strategic plan. So, you know, all these issues we're going to come up with, keep wrestling with, you know, is there hope? Yeah, I, I like to think there is. You know, Rob mentioned the FEMA strategic plan, and if you had just ask you to go look at it, uh, objective two, be ready for the catastrophic. Objective 2.3, I am the accountable executive for. And I, I hold out great hope that we're going to make big progress in this realm. There are three legs of that stool uh, of 2.3, which is basically get all things to all people from all sources of supply out there. Uh, and there's three legs. One, we're going to improve the the way we do it now, this kind of interagency model of we have contracts and we store things and 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 the whole federal team comes together and we, we got to get better at that we got to be uh you know more robust more agile and all but the other two legs are the more important ones and get to this crowd here one is is private sector integration being able to talk back and forth and understand each other and being able to integrate that great capacity of the private sector with ours and then the other one is to build capacity in states and regions right now i'll tell you is the logistician in fema we are far too light. I mean, I'm, I'm spreading the gospel, private sector integration, and I could have folks downrange. I mean, got Sean Matz out in Region 9. He is all on board. But when I came on board in FEMA Logistics, I looked at how, what's, what's the status of logistics in FEMA. I think in Region 4, hit by a lot of hurricanes and the benefit beneficiary of a, of a lot of history, had nine loggies in their log section. Okay, no, not bad. Region 10, our nightmare scenario, the Cascadia Subduction Zone, we had zero. You know, as, as, as positions became open, they got moved elsewhere. We had none there. And, and so building state and local capacity so that we have believers like us in this business, because, I mean, we get, with a 3,000-mile screwdriver, we can't solve the private sector integration thing from D.C. I think it's got to happen locally, regionally, with great states like North Carolina and others. And I got to build capacity within FEMA, and I got to help states build capacity to think about these things. And, and I think we've gotten the gospel out there. There are a lot of believers now. It's up to me to resource them. And I think the strategic plan has us going in that direction to build, help us build our own capacity at regions and states to do the supply chain integration and then be able to do the kind of classic mission bigger and better. Uh, so all of them together have a better solution. I think the biggest thing for me is uh, on the kind of what I would call the hard uh, end of the continuum is to kind of continue to uh, advocate this message within government that, you know, we've got a life-saving operation, uh, but very quickly that moves into what do we need to get fixed for the continued enabling of life. So uh, hospitals getting, you know, fuel and the transformers and whatever those things are, there's a real fine line where if I start waving my hand too quick, they start saying, hey, get out of um, our op center, Matt, because we're not to that point yet. But it's it's that I saw great uh, strides. I thought we moved towards that. And as we see more things like unmanned aerial systems needing to fly into impacted areas to inspect infrastructure systems, we saw a lot of that. There's a lot of FAA, uh, you know, oversight in those things now as you have to file flight plans and there's temporary flight restricted areas in getting sort of the, uh, the avenue to, to allow those things to happen. Uh, need to continue pushing that down the field. And I think it's getting there, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of recognition from, from the government to kind of help, uh, you know, pull the levers on that. Uh, on the easier side, I think, is some of the stuff that Rob and I uh, did. Uh, and, you know, we, we look forward to the, to Tom, your help on uh, doing things like RFI trackers for the MBOC. I think we, I uh, don't, I can, I'm allowed to quote these statistics. Is that right? Okay. Uh, so if you have 40,000 people on the calls, 4,000 probably RFIs, we're sure we missed something. Because uh, we didn't really, we weren't prepared for that. I think in, in what we we're doing jointly, we need to be better at that because there were some, I think, opportunities probably missed. Yeah, to follow up on that, I think one of the things that uh, you know, uh, so I guess national level exercise starts next week, but there's never, I really don't think you can never show up too late to an exercise because even that itself is realistic, right? Because every disaster, inevitably, there'll be somebody that has a capability that oh, I never thought about using this capability uh, in that regard before. So if you haven't, uh, if you're not playing in the NLE uh, or um, for that matter, integrating into the new Madrid uh, uh, exercise, which is going to be next year, there's still the planning effort that, that's going on, uh, going on for that. 
great opportunities to do that, uh, that, that integration uh, on the planning side. Uh, the second thing is really help us be specific. Only by having, we have good open lines of communication between public and private sector. And I recognize that not um, everybody in the room or, or, or on the phone is, um, you know, doing this public private work every single day. But when you do get a chance to, uh, you know, have, convene in meetings like this or in other sessions, uh, like, you know, like Pennsylvania's and standing up the, their effort, which I think is awesome that the governor's showing that kind of leadership, um, is really be specific. And I think both sides need to be specific. So as you're having this conversation, really be specific. So if it's, I'm from industry X, and it would be great if government Y did, you know, Z, that is the kind of discussion that we need to have. We, we've really, I think, matured to a, a level of conversation of, you know, moving beyond, you know, what can I do to help, right? And that's really, that was for two years when, when I got this job, that's really how I started. But now it's, how can I be of help specifically? And, and, and how can I use data to ask a better question? So I think if we can move forward in that direction, whether it's through All Hazards or, or the Fleet Working Group uh, or, in other, uh, or in other organizations, I think that that's certainly going to move us, move us even farther. And again, all disasters being local, so that capability capacity that Jeff's talking about, you know, FEMA can't FEMA can't always be the convener of that conversation. It needs to be someone in Pennsylvania or North Carolina or Florida having that conversation. It can't always be for as much as enabling as we can do. Um, it really does need to have that state uh, state and local tie, or else it's or or else you know the tree's going to have you know very very very. Uh, short route and it's going to get uprooted. Thank you. Just one quick, quick reclaim on saved ground or whatever in artillery. Chart. Silly me, you know the the title of the slide talks about sensitive information sharing environment, and I will tell you what one of the implementation strategies says we are going to adopt, you know, SICE as one of our platforms of choice to share information. I'm absolutely committed to that, and, and that's and and just not adopt it for the sake of adopt adopting it. Man, we need to exercise it continue to build the relationships, you know, take the lessons that we've learned in past events and out of exercises and bake that into our plans. So more to the point, hey, this was supposed to be about SICE and talk about information sharing. I mean, we're committed to, to using that because I think it has great, great promise uh, and it, it'll only realize its promise. We all get together, put our heads together, get the right apps, get the right way of using it. So it, we, we are committed in people logistics to drive, to help, to help drive the train on that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to all the panelists. If we can get a round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Chris. Okay. The next uh, the next panel is going to talk about um, how we. Uh, why don't you come on up, Carrie and and Dave and, and uh, Karen. So the next panel is going to talk about how do we decipher whether something's operationally ready or not. Uh, this came out of a story. We, uh, during a storm, one time we had, um, I won't reference the organization, we had data come into the fleet work group that we sent out, and uh, it ended up being wrong. It looked really good, but it was really wrong, okay? And, and it, was, it was painful wrong, okay? So that said, okay, we got to find a way to do this. So John Shader was the chair, and he and I spoke about, okay, how do we do this? we we got to find some way to do it. Well, sure enough, the SICE working group had been working on this. We partnered with the ESIP Federation, the Earth Science Information Partnership, 180 organiz 100 plus organizations, right? 100 plus organizations, right? And we were looking at the way they vet data. So you're going to hear today about a standard being developed. You can be part of that. If you want to be part of this committee, just send us an email, um, and we'll, ex we'll uh, uh, draft people. What we're trying to do is how do we rank data one to four? We'll go through the process. But Carrie Hicks from Duke Energy is the chair for that work group. So Carrie, I'll introduce you in the panel, and off you go. I need to make sure, okay, I'll use this. We'll be safe. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Again, my name's Carrie Hicks. I'm a data analyst at Duke Energy. Uh, I'm also the team lead for our geospatial peer team, Storm Mode, which is an organization within Duke Energy that gets activated during storm. And as Tom mentioned, I am the chair of the ORL subcommittee. So I'm going to be talking a little bit here in the beginning about the philosophy and the reasoning and the story behind the ORL model and why it came to be. Which one you want? Um, the one that says intro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no. The one 
his intro. Yes. One is his intro. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> yeah, it's rolling. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so as we go through life and we make purchasing decisions, we are always looking to brand identity, certification, rankings, and even peer reviews to inform those decisions. We want to make sure that we're getting the best, uh, best value for our money, but also, more importantly, that the products we're bringing around our families are safe. However, do we always have the same scrutiny when it comes to the data that drives our decision making? Let's say John here works for an electrical utility company, and he is helping respond to a storm that has a significant number of outages. Hello? Is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so John is helping to respond to a storm that has a significant number of outages. We have some data sets here that uh, he's going to use that are going to help guide him as he schedules truck rolls. We have a routing data set, a housing data set for mutual assistance, weather, and flooding data. But how can we be fully confident in these data sets? First of all, where did the routing data come from? Did it come from a reliable and trusted source? How frequently is the housing data updated? Is there any metadata for the weather data set that could help him interpret the data? And what if the server goes down for a period of time for the flooding data? All of these questions impact the reliability and confidence in the data set that he's using. So to better illustrate this, um, I'm gonna tell a personal story. So during Hurricane Irma, we encountered a very large problem. <laughs> this is gonna come up again as it did in the last panel. So after all the evacuations out of the state, uh, many gas stations were without fuel along some of the key routes into Florida. We had to move our truck's convoys in from out of state and they were getting stranded due to lack of fuel. <laughs> so to help with this, I tracked down an ArcGIS REST service that contained GasBuddy data, as we mentioned in the last panel. So if anybody's not familiar, GasBuddy is a crowdsourced app that lets you know which gas stations are open, the price of gas, and whether or not they have fuel. So I added this to our routing application, and this did help us reroute our convoys to roads that actually had operating gas stations. So you assume that all is well. Well, not exactly. The gas buddy service that I found was actually riddled with problems. There was no metadata, so I didn't even know who was actually serving that data to the web or any other information. I didn't know how long it would be up, how often it was updated, or really anything else. It was just a blank ArcGIS REST service that I just plug and play right into our application. This could have actually had major implications for our ability to restore power. If you think about it, especially after everything calmed down after Irma, looking back, I thought, wow, what if there was something wrong with that data set? I would have no idea. So what are the implications of that? Well, first of all, most importantly, the greatest implication is safety. Coming from the electrical utility industry, obviously safety is number one priority. We're always talking about it. Our ability to operate safely is incredibly important. If that gas buddy data was maybe not being updated all of a sudden, we had no way of knowing, that could have had major implications for our ability to operate safely. Secondly, bad data can lead to bad decisions, obviously. So if you don't have good data or you don't know how good your data is, your decisions are probably going to reflect that as they say garbage in, garbage out. Third, and this kind of gets to the core philosophy behind the ORL model, is miscommunication. So it's not so much that we shouldn't use the gas buddy data, but inevitably these applications that host these data sets are gonna get shared around. I'm gonna share it to Steve McGugan at Duke Energy, who's our Director of Emergency Preparedness, and he's gonna share it to Mike Larkin, and he's gonna share it to Howard Fowler, and it's gonna go around to different people. It could be 20 or 30 people. Are we really going to tell each person, hey, you know, be careful of this one data set. It's kind of wonky. We're not really sure where it comes from. We don't have a high level of confidence. No, obviously we can't do that. There's no way to be able to monitor who's using the data set and how they're interpreting it. And that's what this, this ORL model is really trying to get at. So you really don't want your data to be the weak link in the chain. For us, uncertainty in the data leads to reduced efficiency and the restoration of power to our customers which drives up costs while decreasing performance. So to drive this home, the purpose of the ORL model is to standardize the ranking of data sets to better communicate the level of confidence that empowers better data-driven decision-making. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen and Dave, I believe, and they're going to talk a little bit more about the model itself. And they're over there. Do you guys have microphones? And does this work? Yeah. Good. Uh, hello, I'm Karen Moe, and um, part of the Earth Science Information Partners, uh, we are collaborating. Uh, is this any better? Okay. Uh, we are collaborating with um, the All Hazards Consortium here, looking at the issues of trusted data. And uh, when when the question came up, uh, we look back to, uh, I wanted to give you a little of the history behind uh, the influences for the uh, ORL. Um, I, I spent about 20 years working within the NASA's Earth Science Technology Office, and we had uh, based, uh, we were basically involved in developing technology, evaluating technology, and infusing technology. So uh, we had what we call technology readiness levels. This was uh, a maturity assessment tool that uh, both DOD and NASA was using, uh, especially for spaceflight missions. And uh, it basically broke down into, it was a nine level uh, tool to, to assess where you wanted to put your emphasis in, in technology development. And we saw a lot of analogies between that uh, tool and what we needed with uh, data, especially trusted data for uh, the specific applications. The TRL kind of broke down into three major areas. One was kind of basic research where uh, you were validating components. Another level was where you were putting validated components together into a subsystem and building prototypes and testing and evaluating those prototypes. And then the third maturity level was that you were qualifying this technology for uh, mission operations and then actually proving it, uh, whether you were flying uh, a component in space or uh, a lot of the technology I was uh, involved in had to do with uh, utilizing the data that was coming back from space and, and getting it into the hands of scientists uh, as quickly as possible. So we thought that this uh, could be a good model. We showed it to uh, the folks here within the, the size uh, group looking at, uh, you know, how are we going to manage uh, this idea of, of uh, trusted data? And they said, nah, nine levels, too much. So uh, we came up then with this four levels and uh, just giving you uh, a maturity uh, development from the lowest level of four moving up to an ORL one. Uh, and so I think with that, I can turn it over to Dave uh, to go through some examples. Thanks, Karen. So uh, I'm going to show you a few slides uh, from here, uh, but essentially the work that Karen described uh, translated very well into uh, another organization that we belong to called the ESIP Federation. It's the Federation of Earth Science Information Partners uh, that was founded in 1997 by 24 NASA-funded projects. So that has evolved now to a group of organizations that's over 120 organizations that only focus on data. And it's all sorts of data. Some of it is very applicable to decision-making here. Others uh, are applicable to more research-based topics. So uh, when we brought this in, like Karen said, it, uh, it received uh, from Tom and the SICE committee sort of a, a, a resounding uh, yes, we need to do this. And so uh, this is an example, and I have some examples of data sets, uh, what uh, applies to certain ORL levels. So as you see on the screen, uh, the ORL levels go from one to four with one uh, being the data sets that are most readily available and applicable to decision-making and decision-making environments today. So you can see data is fully available now, meets all the criteria, metadata is complete, updated frequently, and the service is secure. Data has been verified and tested, and users of the data may make data-driven decisions with confidence. 
That's an ORL1. An ORL2, and, and these definitions are continuing to evolve. Oh, thanks. So these, these, uh, these definitions are continuing to evolve with input from the SICE and input from others who we present this to uh, because we know that there are other use cases and other types of uh, perhaps research that some ORL levels may be different for different applications. So in ORL2, the data set meets all the criteria of ORL1 except that it may be missing key pieces of metadata. Everybody understand what metadata is. It's data about the data, information about the data. So if you don't know who produced that, or you don't know a phone number, or you don't know somebody you can call to verify that the service is being updated and this is the latest information, then it would be an ORL2. And so that data is still considered operational, but users may make data-driven decisions still with confidence. See, as long as you know what the standing of the data is when you access it to use it for decision making, you are approaching that decision uh, with much more uh, educated about that uh, type of data. ORL3 steps into the data set is still verified and tested, but, but not, and not in a development or testing phase. The data set may not be secure, may experience downtime, the format may not be interoperable, and uh, considered non-operational data. However, it could still be useful. What if a NASA research satellite passes over and it takes information on a wildfire that was just starting to form in a certain area? That could be very useful. You just lucked out with the pass of the satellite. It came over and you can use that information. But it's not really operational because that satellite isn't going to be over for another 16 days because the way it, it, uh, it orbits. Uh, use the data with caution in disaster response scenarios. An ORL4 data set is in development or in testing phase, not yet operational. It may not contain metadata. It's sort of on the radar screen for product evolution. In other words, this is a really, this could be a really good data set. We're watching it. We're seeing how it evolves, and then we'll bring it into uh, the environment uh, for testing once it uh, improves a little bit more. So an ORL4 is likely not uh, for use for decision making, uh, and it's uh, and so that's why we say likely. There, there are uh, occasional uh, opportunities where it, it could be, I guess. So here's some examples of what I, what we mean by by data sets. ORL4, which is not quite ready uh, yet, uh, could be um, open closed data from sources uh, that are using and monitoring financial transactions so we can see whether these stores are open or closed. It's, gr it's great, it just hasn't been tested and vetted into the data sharing environment. Here's another one. This is uh, very intriguing. This is taking two satellite images and subtracting one from another so we can pull out the track of EF4 and EF5 tornadoes in Alabama. So, so NASA is able to do this with their satellite imagery. It may not be uh, something that they can produce in a, an hour or two from satellite data acquisition, but when you can pull out these tracks, there's a whole lot of information you can do with this. You, now you know where to look for the damage. Now you know how to assess what's going on. You can overlay critical infrastructure on these paths and find out how many times the tornado track passed right across your uh, transmission lines or uh, other types of uh, critical infrastructure. So this is an ORL4 only because this isn't something you can go to every time there's a tornado. It actually has to be produced by uh, some folks at NASA at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, because they have the algorithms to do it. Now, if the SICE committee and the users like the utilities and, and others come back and say, hey, we love that, then we can start to give that feedback to NASA and they can say, well, maybe we should focus on this a little bit more because it's useful for uh, data-driven decision-making. Here's another one. The GOES satellite that was just launched by NOAA has a lightning sensor on it. So this is lightning all around the uh, Western Hemisphere and we're thinking that could be very valuable for potential wildfire developments, uh, potential um, uh, hazards that could uh, exist from lightning strikes. It's not operational yet, but when it becomes operational, it could go from a four to a one 
There's no rule that says you can't go from a four to a one. It just it doesn't have all the metadata and the testing in the environment that we've uh, that, that we have established. Stepping up to an ORL three, this could this is an example of a data set that's uh, sort of like a crowdsourced data set using Twitter on storm reports and damage reports that uh, University of Alabama Huntsville is working on from a NASA funded project. And we know a lot of other people are using uh, crowdsourcing types of uh, data gathering capability. And, uh, and that's something that shows some real promise. It's an ORL3, could be helpful at times, but we say use it with caution. Um, here's another ORL3, modeling of flooded areas, uh, which is uh, uh, coming in from uh, high resolution uh, mo uh, models and satellite imagery. This is a three because it's evolving into a more of an operational data set. Uh, we were just funded uh, from NOAA to work with the JPSS, the Joint Polar Satellite Program, to work with uh, uh, flooding ice river, uh, river ice and flooding data sets to uh, adapt them into decision-making environments. It's not operational yet, but it could be, and it could be uh, uh, used for decision-making with higher levels of confidence as we go forward into the future. Here's another one, ORL2. So this is, what this is, is a night lights uh, image from satellites. So the polar orbiting satellites have a day-night band on them. So we can see every night, we can see where the lights are on and where the lights are off around the world. So uh, when you do a comparison, it's tough to see in this particular uh, image, but the image on the right, you see a red tint to the uh, to these areas. This is after Hurricane Matthew, and this is the red lights or the power out. This is where the power is out. So you just assign red to the lights that should be on that aren't, and then automatically you can see the extent of the power outages. Um, we've gotten very good response. Uh, Mike, you gave me great response yesterday for the use in Puerto Rico for the night lights product, where you could really see the power restoring in Puerto Rico. And we can see that from space, and we can see it very effectively. Here's another one. There's a high-resolution satellite imagery of a train derailment and explosion in Canada. Uh, this is something that uh, could be an ORL2. It is an ORL2. It's just that it's pretty expensive to task your own satellite and get a, get a satellite image in here to use. But uh, when there are major disasters, uh, there are uh, charters that are executed and, and put into play that allow the data acquisition uh, trained to be going uh, so we can really get imagery into the decision-making environment. Here's a two. This is another product. This is, uh, this is restrictions to visibility uh, based on uh, satellite imagery and smoke detection. So, so these are, are out, these are, uh, these little areas you see like in North Carolina and Virginia, it's all um, smoke plumes. And so these could act to restrict visibility and the denser the smoke gets, you see it get a little purple there in South Carolina. This is something that can be used operationally. Also, uh, the GO satellite that launched um, has uh, the ability to update imagery every five minutes. And a sensor that's on board can detect heat differences. So now we can see from 22,300 miles up in space, fires that are starting to form in the plains or in the forests. So we don't need big signatures for it to be uh, show up as a one pixel. As a matter of fact, um, the National Weather Service is alerting 911 operators when they see a hot pixel develop before they even get a 911 call locally that there's a fire. So, so the National Weather Service has been uh, actually able to alert uh, first responders to go and check out a potential fire. And now the National Weather Service is starting to think, hey, wait a minute, is this our job? Is this our job to do that? We really have to look and see what we're, because if we start doing this, people are going to expect us to do it all the time. So we really should be careful. But the satellite is amazing. Here's bumping up to ORL1. This is totally operational, available all the time. This is the National Weather Service watch warning and advisory product. This is updated every minute. It comes from their uh, internet dissemination portal or uh, program, IDP out of College Park, Maryland, and they have a backup server in Boulder, Colorado. And this shows all of the advisories in, in effect, minute by minute uh, throughout the country. And then you can click on each one of those and see what those advisories are. Here's another one. We all know the National Weather Service radar. 
The radar data is processed and, and published uh, every six to 11 minutes, depending on the mode that the radars are in. And we can now put this into the uh, data sharing environment, give it an ORL uh, of one. So um, I think that's it for, for mine. Yep, that's the last slide that I have. So I'm gonna hand this back over to Carrie so she can take you through the next uh, part of this and then we'll open it up for some discussion. Perhaps. So while this is loading really quickly, I'll just say, so Dave did a great job of showing some examples of different data sets and how they might be ranked. We're going to actually dive deep into the model as it currently stands and how you would actually go through ranking a data set um, using the current model, which is always under development. We're adding new criteria, refining certain criteria, but as it stands, it is a working model. You can rank any data set and determine what its ORL level would be um, in its current state. Come on. <laughs> Any questions while we're standing here? Yes. Or for whoever. I wonder if I should reload this. Um, this is more of a, a comment, but the ORL model helped us not just with um, you know, looking at the different data that's available through SICE, but uh, in the most recent North nor'easter storms that we had, um, we had some folks that in our response coordination center that had found some data on um, the status of uh, residential power. And when we were looking at it, it the numbers differed than perhaps what was being reported to the utility commission. And there's a number of reasons for that, but what we found was there was no way in looking at this data that everyone seemed to suddenly be using, there was no way to really have a common agreement on the validity of the data. And that's when I pulled out the ORL model and as a way to kind of discuss this is okay if you want to have this on the screen in here as a point of discussion but you probably don't want to use this to make a major decision and here's some criteria that would help you kind of make that decision so I just wanted to point out the the model that you've created has so many uses and it was a really helpful tool for us to kind of have that common language. Awesome, Tom, how are we on time? Just wanting to get a landmark. Okay, so just kind of to what you just said, um, and speaking to the last panel as well, that which is kind of a, a good transition into this one, um, this idea that trusted data sets are federal data sets, um, which we all know isn't true. There's data out there that's provided by um, nonprofits or provided by um, private companies that could be ORL level ones. We just don't have a federated standard of being able to rank them and compare them in that way, which is the whole purpose behind this model. And then also getting at what you were saying, this model is meant to be agile. It's meant to be used in the field on the fly. If you come across a data set online that you find that you need right now, you can rank it in five minutes and then you can communicate the confidence level of that data right away which we all know, you know, we can do all the preparation in the world to make sure that we have the data we need, but when an emergency strikes, you're gonna be scrambling for something, it's just the way it is. But by doing this, if I hand that data off to my superiors or the people that are gonna be making decisions based on it, I can say, this is an ORL too, and they're gonna know what that means right away. So that's, that's kind of getting to the entire purpose behind this exercise. So my Prezi's up, so I'm gonna get started on that. So this graphic actually represents the criteria that determine a data set's ORL ranking as a decision tree. So you start at the top left where it says trusted and vetted source, and um, you answer each question about the data set. So if the answer is no, you move to the right and thus down a level 
If the answer is yes, you move down, which is maintaining the same ORL level. So essentially you start at a one and you're deducing as you move down and say no to the different criteria. So I wanna briefly explain the difference between the blue and the green criteria. You can see the blue boxes and the green boxes. So the blue criteria represent what we consider non-use case specific criteria. So this means that no matter what the data is being used for, these standards will influence the ranking equally. So no matter what, the restoration redundancy, no matter what the use case is, we need to make sure that we have um, redundancy in terms of servers. So if the server goes down, there's a cluster there so that it'll go back up, for example. But the green criteria represent use case specific standards. So for example, if your use case is simply situational awareness, a more coarse spatial resolution might be perfectly suitable for that, right? So if you just kind of want to lay of the land, maybe 20 meter by 20 meter resolution is fine. You don't need it to be more uh, precise than that. So this will make a little more sense as we move through an example. So it's important to point out uh, two points about the ORL model from the get-go. So in order for data sets to be rankable on the model at all, they have to come from a trusted and vetted source. And to be honest, we're still working out what that means. Again, we've mentioned usually the federal government is a trusted and vetted source. Um, we're working with, there's another committee called the Data Providers Committee. Got that right? Um, they're working through that process of determining what that means. But it has to come from a trusted and vetted source. If it comes from Bob down the street that you know from you know whatever, then it's probably not going to be rankable on the model yet. It also has to be in an interoperable format. So an interoperable format is described as any format that can easily be shared and consumed in a standard mapping application, like a shapefile, a REST service, or a CSV with geographic coordinates. So basically, if you have any sort of standard, you know, ArcGIS Online, um, you might have ArcGIS Desktop, Google Earth, something like that, it has to be in a format that can easily and quickly be consumed in that application. If it's not, then it's really not rankable on the model as it currently stands. Not ranked. <laughs> so the graphic also highlights the relative weights of certain criteria. Certain criteria, if not met, will immediately reduce the overall ranking from a one to a three. So for example, if it's not SSL or HTTPS encrypted, meaning if it's being served over the web as HTTP or it's not encrypted, that's gonna automatically bump it down to an ORL level of three. I think I just went too far. Hold on one second. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, also, if the, um, there we go. So you can see where it says SSL HTTPS, it moves over to no, not SSL HTTPS, that's gonna make it a three. Um, also, if it's not, interoperable, but it's mostly interoperable. I would consider this to be an Excel spreadsheet with geographic coordinates. There's gonna be some data massaging there to get that into a mapping application, but it's still operable enough, interoperable enough, but it's gonna be an overall level of three. Uh, same thing with downtime. So some services actually go down for maintenance on a regular basis. Um, it might go down on the weekend when no one's in the office. You know, that might still be a useful data set, but perhaps not in a, oh, Oh. oh, thank you. So we're looking at this right here, so some downtime. Um, if it goes down over the weekend for maintenance on a regular basis, then that's gonna bump it down to a three. And keep in mind that's different from the server failed, you know, that is going down too, but this is more regular maintenance type downtime. So let's say our data set meets the most critical requirements that we just discussed. So it's from a trusted and vetted source. It's securely um, served over the internet. It's interoperable. It has restoration and redundancy built into the service. So maybe it's served over a cluster and it doesn't have any downtime. But let's say for this data set that there's no notification of changes in case that changes have been made. So this would automatically bump it down to an ORL level of two. And I just kind of want to talk about that for a second, this whole change notification idea. 
that actually came out of a couple of experiences that we've had in these last couple of hurricanes, Matthew, Irma. Um, if we grab a service online and we want to consume it in an application and something changes, maybe they change the symbology or they, you know, change the extent of the data set and they don't notify the users in some way, that could have a major implication and impact on the understanding of the data set or the interpretation of that. So in order for it to be an overall level of one and we understand, you know, having notification is kind of a, a, a big ask from data providers, but it's very important, um, it's going to automatically bump that down to a two. So a few more notes about this decision tree model. If a data set, as Dave mentioned, is in a development or testing phase, that data automatically receives a ranking of four. So this, again, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be used at all but we would consider it to be non-operational. So extreme caution should be used when using this data set to drive decision-making, especially in a disaster response scenario. Likewise, if there's absolutely no metadata, like in our Gas Buddy example, that would also place the data at an overall level of four. So we place you know, really high priority on the completeness, completeness of metadata, because if you don't have metadata, you don't know anything about the data, you can't really have a level of confidence at all in that data. So that concludes that portion. Um, I guess we're going to open it up for questions. We have plenty of time. So. I actually have a question, but I'm not sure who it's for. <laughs> One of the panelists. We Data can start out as a four, work its way up to a three, a two, and then a one, I would imagine, as they get better at it. Are, is someone always watching the data to see if what was a one last, last storm it was a one for me, but the next big storm I get involved with is four months later. Should I be going back to validate that that data is still a one or is somebody doing that for me? That's a, that's a great question, Mike. And so, so the whole concept is that you as a user of this data should be able to trust what the ORL level is. So you wouldn't have to keep watching the data to make sure that it, if something happens to it or whatever. It should be the, the organization that's making that data available to you, say through the All Hazards Consortium or in the dashboard or in another instance of, of, of another, you know, geo collaborator, something else. So if it's there, that's why we want to indicate what ORL level it is right next to the file name itself when it's being displayed. So if something happens, like Carrie said, if she finds out that there's no change notice coming out from a data set we had of ORL1 and we noticed that it changed, then we can change that to an ORL2. And, and that is something that, you know, as this process evolves, we'll start to set the standards for how will, who, you know, what organization, is it the ESIP Federation? Is it the disaster lifecycle cluster that's going to take that on and make sure that they're ranking these data sets correctly? Or could it be people within your own organization, right? You can, you can the model that, that uh, has been developed, you can go through a whole, Carrie didn't get a chance to show it, mm -hmm. but a whole question, series of questions about your data, and then it spits out what an ORL level should be. So this allows this model to be applied at your organization internally that may not even see the light of day except within your own firewalls. So, so that's what the model's about. There's a lot of flexibility in assigning the ORL numbers, but the data sets that are available in the dashboard should be ones that are monitored for you. And if something takes a big turn, then that ORL number is going to change. Thank as you. It should change your, your, uh, your assessment of whether, you know, your decision. Correct. I'll just jump in really quickly on that question. So, as Dave mentioned, there's kind of there's kind of a dichotomy in how this is being uh, planned to be used, right? You've got the authoritative source, whether that's within the SICE, um, the SICE framework or within ESIP, you have your authoritative ranking, but then you also simultaneously have the ability to export that into your own organization, use the model, and rank it that way. And that really speaks, I think, to the importance of having people and, and staff within your organization that are properly knowledgeable to do that which I would argue would be GIS people, right? Because oftentimes GIS people, you know, we kind of, you know, straddle the line between operations and data science. In my case, I'm actually in operations, but, you know, you see what I'm saying. So we have a little bit of the background to be able to take that, interpret it, and then communicate 
this is what the overall level should be. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We're talking a little bit about some organizational conversations here for that, but just wanted to throw that out there. So th thanks, and uh, th these are great presentations, Carrie, Karen, and Dave. Uh, the green uh, care categories that you had there are criteria. Uh, you said that they represented uh, different use cases. So I'm just wondering if you have a, a, a data set that's a three for a particular use case, are you going to be are you documenting that in such a way that uh, if that data set is used for a different use case, that it would be, uh, and it has a different level, that would be uh, identified uh, for that other use case as being a different level? Yeah. So, um, so this is the this is the part of the evolving of the ORL levels that exists, which is going to become part of the discussions we have within the disaster lifecycle cluster, right? So people are exactly going to see that. Hey, this ORL level is, could be a one for me because I, you know, I'm used to getting data updates every 16 days. If I get something every, you know, two weeks, then that's great. You know, so so it really does come down to use cases. And so if they have different ORL levels that they want to apply, they can still apl apply that to the data in, within their own organization. So they're still communicating it within their own organization. When you have a, a decision-making environment like the SICE or the Fleet Response Working Group that's looking to support the movement of fleet utility vehicles and helping to, to make decisions, then those ORL level changes can, or assignments can be done at a little higher level. So, and it's the same question if you talk about research data versus operational data. How do you assign ORL levels to research data? We haven't, we haven't focused in on that yet because this is an operational community and we're really focusing on letting, letting the utilities and others drive their decision making by saying, hey, I need this kind of data, I need this kind of data, I need this. And that's what you see showing up on the dashboard within the Fleet Response Working Group and the 1SO, the, the, the uh, one-stop um, ops for the uh, All Hazards Consortium. So that's focusing on the operational decisions that need to be made. So it's an evolutionary process. This is something that isn't going to say, hey, we're going to be done by July of this year. It's going to keep growing, and uh, the model will keep adding sophistication to it. Great. Thanks, Dave. Right now we have, so I'm on the board of a couple organizations, one is the U.S. Payments Forum. All the digital transactions that are done in this hemisphere, person and non-hemisphere, are done by our member group. So whether they're Amazon or Apple or Samsung or NEC chip manufacturers or the critical infrastructure that you use just to make a payment. I don't know the model that you have as it relates to what private sector retail transactions are. But one of the things that Tom found very useful during was the ability to start understanding is a, is a gas stations open? Are they doing transactions at what rate? And they came up with a clunky but very innovative method that you were part of the White House briefing within a week after starting it. One of the questions is, is most of the people really don't know what you're looking for. So at one point or another, as you're walking through your formal models, if you want complementary data, it's just something to reach out to the other communities that are generating that data as a matter of course. This is a huge area outside of the public safety area because we're looking at the evolution of smart connected transactions. You're taking environmental data in context of, of various transactions. Everything from putting sensors in clothing so people can have a better workout and their performance pieces all the way through to how do we sp how do we spread fertilizer in an effective way. There's a lot of data that's being generated right now, but they have no idea what your needs are. So it's just something that you should think about in the future is talking to the other groups. 
No, absolutely. That's that's terrific. I appreciate that input. And and you're right. I mean, the 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 data. Um, that's why it's important. And it's I think it's been mentioned already today. Is how do you know what you don't know when you say what what kind of data do you need? You know, tell me what you need. And says, well, I don't know what I need until the, the until it happens, right? And then I know what I I need. Um, so this kind of input is critical. So we can start to um, think about how to combine those different data sources. Right now, this is really focused on like Earth observation data. It's focused on surface observation data, movement, you know, uh, information, things like that to support the needs of this uh, group. But we can sort of see how this model can really expand out and apply. Director of Public Safety at Esri. Um, there, there's a uh, there's a concept that I'd like to maybe bring that I think would help the other side of this equation called EEIs, essential elements of information. And this is where decision makers got together and decided what they wanted from each other for as information. This was tested in the last QSIC exercise, will be tested in the next one, the New Madrid exercise next year. And for that entire 18 state region, or eight state region, and 12 tertiary state region, they came up with 18 things that they wanted to know from each other. Could be more or less for this group, but it provided a programmatic framework for developing data. Each EEI is actually a project. If you say, I wanna know transactional data as, as a means of determining whether or not gas stations are open, well, there's a lot of steps to that. You laid them out. But that's a, that becomes a program, and you figure out the right ways to do it, and then the ORLs fit into that so you know the data that's supporting that EEI is, is of value. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, I'll send Tom some documentation on EEIs. Um, there is a national standard to them, and as I said, they've been tested. And one major exercise will be tested again next year, but it kind of narrows the playing field in the data world. Um, might help. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. To draw what Chris just said about EEIs, go back to what Tom is always talking about, use cases. For every one of those use cases, there should be a set of EEIs that drive the data that allow you to be able to establish the veracity of it. Amen. <laughs> They're helping me with next year's agenda. <laughs> Others? Gary, thank you. Dave, thank you. Karen, thank you. Comment? Other, um, just one more real quick um, sort of poll of the of the audience here, and that is, um, you know, we're looking to get more information on lots of products that are being produced. One example is that the uh, the National Hurricane Center um, has indicated their interest in having a one day workshop with the private sector, uh, so the private sector can come down to the National Hurricane Center and understand how the hurricane forecast products are put together. And they also would like input from the private sector organizations as to what information would you like from the National Hurricane Center. 
So I just wanted to see a quick show of hands. Who would be interested in something like that? Because we're trying to put put something like that together. So, oh, good. Okay, great. So it's a, a number of you. We'll work through Tom and uh, because it'll probably be something that the All Hazards Consortium will be a part of. And it'll probably be in the maybe the first or second week in June. Um, so that uh, hurricane season starts June 1st. They have a brand new director, um, Ken Graham, who's the director of the National Hurricane Center. And they're really uh, looking very forward uh, to working with the private sector and getting information back too. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dave. All right. Okay. Um, home stretch. You've heard a lot about the size, the size, the size. What's the size? It's not a product. It's a place. Designed to vet people, <clears throat> a slot them to a use case. Jim, you articulated it once again perfectly, right? It has to start with the use case. You cannot burden, uh, burden people with data and have them trying to figure out the portal to make the decision. If it's not three clicks away, it's over. How many have experienced that, right? You get a link and you go to it, you can't hunt around the website. So the whole purpose of the site is to organize that. So you've heard a lot about it. There was a flyer given out. Uh, we're in a process for a, a pilot project now with DHS. Uh, they are funding a lot of the fr framework. The private sector is building a model for sustainment. So this will be a really good example of public-private investment, right? And then they're going to leverage groups, products, and tools to bring it all together and slot it to a use case. No product, no data set or anything will be in the site unless it's tied to a use case. Okay, so, so over time, you'll see things organized that will uh, speed up information sharing and more importantly, decision making. So, um, so let me just, two things. This is what the site looks like. There's people, okay? And right now they go through a identity verification and vetting process, very creative, without issuing a brand new ID. The only ID, and we had a lot of conversation about this in the fleet work group, about whether they got a PIV I card or, a, you know, a, a, come up with a brand new card and, we had five companies that sell cards and Lockheed and Boeing and said, you know, we need something states can use low cost that can get them in there. So I'll show you what that process is, but we created that process. And the SICE dashboard is prototype right here. Uh, there's going to be an individual offering. There'll be a corporate offering. And then we're going to organize things by sector, which is great. The sectors want to develop their own use cases. That's fine. Tom said it very well. We're going to leverage other groups to do the use case development. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to work with the FSI SAC, right, to get financial sector use cases. Then we're going to leverage public and private investment to find the tools or the products, slot them, ORL them, and stick them in the. So, so there's one place they can go to, not for everything, but just for those use cases. And then from there, you will from there you will off offboard uh, either within the sites or to external websites. And we've got some interesting technology that will validate whether that external website is secure enough for the site. Interesting. So. You might leave the site, but if I go to Gail's website and we find a hole there, it'll tell us there's a hole there. As a matter of fact, I meant to sell, send Dave, I meant to send uh, Dave Murphy, uh, John Murphy at NOAA, tell him he's got a website, it's got a security leak in it. He didn't know it. I didn't even know how it works, but the guy sent, you know, I saw that, I said, where did you come up with that? Oh, it's just software that IT guy. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So I got to tell NOAA, you know, clean it up. It's not secure enough for the private sector. <laughs> That just felt good. That just felt good saying, you know. <laughs> All right, so here's the vetting process. This is key. This is key. So we start with non-participants, and the first thing they do is they watch a, a little video that I made. I hope you like it. And they have to put in their name and email. You'd be surprised how many people that weeds out right there. I'm not giving my email for nothing. That is not a candidate for sensitive information sharing, okay, right off the bat. And we know when they hit that site, okay, we know the IP address. And you'd be amazed how many IP addresses hit that site that are not in the United States. I get an email every day, okay? Iran, I mean, all over the place. They're just bots that are out there pinging it. So bots are already attacking it, right? So we need, to, we need to make sure we monitor that. So we've been working with folks in the NIC, folks in the ISACs. We've been working with uh, folks in the RC3. We had a whole bunch of advisors, probably 60 of them, that have helped us kind of piece this together. So step two then, when they get through there, okay, so uh, I'm going to use... I'm going to use, uh, I use Gail Royster. Gail's, Gail, so Gail opts in, then she goes to tap step two, another little video explaining what's going to happen in step two. So what she's going to do is she's going to, okay, I see it, I like what I want, I hit a button, then I go to the next step. The next step is a two-step process. 
It simply asks her to put in her credit card and $1.99 will be charged against her credit card. And you'd be surprised how many people opt out there, okay? Now, why did we do that? Well, that's a credential every state employee has, a credit card, most of us, right? Number one. Number two, $1.99. You can believe we had arguments about what to charge for that. It should be nothing, and then we can't vet it. So we get down to $1.99, okay? Why do we do that? It validates you, Gail. It validates a valid address. And it validates all kinds of things that would freak you out, okay? We don't need to know that. But you'd be amazed what they can get. And the folks from the, from the financial sector says, that credit card links to a lot of things that is public or private, criminal. I mean, it's amazing what they can do. They can see if that card's been compromised. It sells all kinds of data. All we want to do is validate is Gail, and she lives in Washington, D.C., and she is who she is. That's all we wanted. We didn't need the other data, okay? Very simple. But Gail didn't have to go get fingerprinted, pictured, issued a card like we did on the phase one of the PIVI test, which was great. It was really secure, but overkill, right? So it's really a great workaround. And then the next step is she fills out her name and address like that. Boom. Right away, the card's charged, she gets an email, and then she goes to a tutorial. Here's what you do next. You fill out the app, open your account, and you go to the dashboard. And then we, we, want, to, we want the, through our pilot, we want, to, we want to test this one app. But we've got probably, we had five apps when we opened. We've got about 80 now, okay? It's, uh, it's, there's no shortage of tools. And then when she comes back, she comes in here, she just hits the screen and logs in. What we're introducing here is two things, a two-factor, uh, Thing which which ties then every time they log in they don't have to do a dollar ninety nine every time they log in they do it they do the two factor authentication uh, that ways improve quite a bit so what we want to do why do we want to do that the private sector that is, has the data wants to know who is looking at the data they want to know what they can do with the data which we can control and they also want to know how often and they want to know is it every time Gail logs in is it Gail logging in and the best thing we can get close to her right now is her cell phone and two factor but um, we're also looking at bio, right? So she could use her thumbprint or somebody when you go to the app store. Very simple. No new credential, $1.99 onboard cost, and then it's two-factor. So that met the mail for most of the apps we have. We'll probably have to go to a higher credential if we get into with law, for, law enforcement, but we don't need that right now. So what is the size long-term? Long-term, what we're trying to do is the panel that sat up here today, those folks are meeting, and we're looking to connect FEMA and BOC, FEMA Logistics, DHS, NIC, DOE and DOT. Those are the big federal agencies that issue the waivers that get commerce moving or not. Okay. I love Jess says do no harm. Well, to, I, that, that's, a, that's a great expression. And especially when you have somebody that means it, right? There's one thing to say it. It's another thing to really try to do it and mean it. So what we're looking to do is use SICE to connect in some way, private sector, state EOC, the trade groups, uh, the fusion centers and DOTs and the federal dashboards in a year round process, year round. So down the bottom, what we're looking at is, is technology that will allow us to do the data analytics and the automated virtual exercises. How many of you guys go to exercises? There's 100 people involved and 10 of them really know what's going on and the other 80 or 90 are for trying to figure it out. We, we're, we're building a multi-tiered exercise for freshmen, for sophomores and juniors, and then seniors, people that have been through the protocol will then be involved in the real exercise, which really gets everybody up to speed. Does that make sense? Because every time we do an exercise, we've got a whole bunch of new state players that are new. They are not familiar with the fleet work group. They're not familiar with why do they need declaration. All that education has to be done ahead of time. And who reads the read ahead? Huh? Nobody. So we stopped doing them. So we're going to automate that. That's done through the technology we have here. And it's funny, I'm one of the oldest people in the room now. And every time I, everywhere I go, so a lot of the folks that are in their 20s and 30s, if it's not an iPhone or a mobile device, it doesn't exist. So we're moving in that direction is to, is to some of you are smiling. Uh, so we're moving in that direction, but we want to do blue sky day all the time. And then lastly, when it hits the fan, we want to ramp up right from the same processing tools we've been using right into the, right into the operations. So we exercise the same way we play during, during game day. That's what the private sector wanted. So I wanted to show you what that is. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a handout there. All of you part of this can log into that, test it. We're going to have feedback. We're on Rev2 already. We've made 72 changes based on user feedback, and um, we're, uh, we're excited about it. We're, we're going to go live in March. There'll be an individual subscription model and a corporate model as well. We have another group working that um, and so forth. But we did a little cost analysis. I was down at, uh, in Florida. I was with uh, Mike Sapone was down with the Mutual Assistance Groups. We have one app. It's a playbook. It's called the U.S. Canadian Border Crossing Guide. 
okay, so what's that worth? So we were down in Florida. We had breakfast conversation around, it was 80 trucks, 80 or 90 vehicles stuck for what, four hours, five or something like that. And at the cost per truck per hour like that, that one delay going into Pennsylvania, it was, they were headed to Pennsylvania. The utility in Pennsylvania called them, and that one delay cost 185 grand. One delay of that length. Now, who pays that? Not the Canadian crews. The citizens of Pennsylvania, right? So we, we want to get really good at the financial justification of why to be part of this, what these apps mean financially to the citizenry and to the companies that are, that are, that are actually calling in the resource. So look, we'll go to next steps, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the annual report was just released. I have, uh, I have a couple of hard copies. It was just put out. It's a summary from really last March to this March. Um, it talks about initiatives, projects, partnerships, tools, uh, some, of the, some of the meetings that were going on this past year. Uh, I just wanted you to know it's out. It should be in all of your inboxes. We sent it out this morning at 6 o'clock. We've got a number of meetings. Most significantly here, I think, is this, this one going on in Pennsylvania here at the governor's residence. Really excited about that because once you... Once you get across the regional, you know, you're coming from Texas and you move. We've kind of iced a lot of those issues, I guess, Chris, over the last, with a lot of state help and so forth, but not, knock on wood. Uh, but when you get into the state, that's when the action happens. And that's where we really got to get the ground truth going down at the state and local level. So we're really excited about that. We're working with Persia in North Carolina, Molly and Jeff in Pennsylvania, and Charissa in Maryland. A couple other uh, states want to do that as well. Uh, really excited about that. Uh, we had a big health care uh, webinar just recently, over 600 in that. Kelly McKinney, our board member, says, I want to replicate the fleet work group model in the healthcare sector. We, you guys have product, you've got organization, you've got people. We, we want to replicate that as well. Um, I've been talking to Jeff Dorco about doing something on the logistics front. So we, I made a note, Jeff, we're going to circle back. Mike, Mike Mingus, it's like five Mikes, Mike Mingus and Mike Zappone. Um, learned a lot in the logistics front. So maybe there's two or three things we can do logistically to start moving things quicker. Um, and I, the one I think is probably uh, the most interesting for us is gonna be this whole integrated planning thing here. How do we get the, these agencies to start sharing information? We're kind of doing it already. Uh, I mentioned the SICE pilot, in March, April, is the pi pilot will go live in, um, in May. And uh, we're really excited about that. I think that'll be a really good test of a lot of things. Working groups, we are in the process right now of organizing a, under the fleet working group, just a state liaison group, right, of Molly, Charissa, Persia, and their peers in North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia. So that's going to be an easy one to do. The whole point is to get their input on, get their brush on the canvas, right, as they start painting. Um, a healthcare work group you can see later in 2018, and the last one really is in a drone information sharing group at the state level. We're looking at how EEI's got a great commission, a committee going on right now. I think it's about 80, right? 80 companies or something part of it. It's a big group working the drone issue. What we're going to work on is how do we, how do we, how do we leverage our state and, and the information sharing? How do we leverage that better? What data can we find in the private sector that we can push into public and vice versa in a secure, safe way, very quickly uh, that can get traffic moving, get hospitals back open, get supply chains moving and things like that. So full agenda, but it all starts with the bottom line is trust. Trust. And everybody jumps to data and tools and things like that. But at the end of the day, if, if, as somebody said, if I don't trust you, I'm not going to loan you my lawnmower, let alone data that's sensitive to my organization, right? I thought, what a, what a great one. So I, um, I, uh, I wanted to end up with this so we can get into our, uh, our wrap up and let you guys go. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank our speakers. And panelists for today, I want to thank our host, Pico, our sponsors, Arco, thank you, thank you. our facilitators and speakers. So uh, it's been quite a year. We know we're going to have it in January. We're going to be we're going to be somewhere in January. I haven't gotten okay from Bill yet, but I'm going to ask Bill if they want to host it in January. But I'd like to be January, not get pushed to April. But we didn't expect Puerto Rico to happen either. So uh, usually we meet in January. So we'll try to get that date put together quickly. So Mike, I'll give you the last word, and then we can uh, send everybody home. Thank you again. Uh, Tom did mention everybody that um, I was thinking of as well. I want to thank you all for your time and, and your, most of all your commitment because, again, it, it comes down to uh, what's at stake. And what's at stake is the people that we serve uh, across uh, the United States and really around the world when you think about it. We're all here for a common cause. And, again, if, if we work, uh, if our sectors work against each other, we can really cause uh, we can do more harm than good, but if we work together, uh, there really isn't anything that can't be overcome, but it shouldn't be the worst of times 
when we test our capabilities. It should be all of these small events that lead up to what our own definition is somewhere is what's the big one. Well, the big one, we got to be ready for the big one, right? And we all understand that, and we probably will pull together like we normally do at that time. But why invent the process, the procedure, or build the relationship uh, while being fired upon, so to speak? I'd much ba uh, rather be seasoned in our capabilities and know our capabilities throughout a series of small events and exercises, know what our capabilities are. So that way, when we figure out what we're up against, we know the level of effort that we will need to apply and where to apply it. We want to get the number of meals correct and the bottles of water. I want the correct number of line workers in the correct areas of the country at the correct time for what? For equitable and efficient restoration of electric power. And I think any sector would say the same thing, whether it was telecommunications or medical, right? Why send 500 IV bags to a hospital that has a thousand instead of the one that's running seriously low with 20 left? It's all about information, the sharing of information, and then allowing one another to be successful through that sharing of information to be able to what better serve the people that need our assistance. So um, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Thank you very much again for your input. These subcommittees that Tom, well, the slide's not up there, but these subcommittees really are the next step in drilling down into what we've all talked about. Yes, we want to work together. Yes, we yes we have that da data. Yes, we can use that data. Yes, we're committed. Well, these subcommittees are going to take it to the next level so that we can develop products and systems and places for all of us to go to use dashboards and keep us on the same page when it comes to managing restoration and recovery efforts. I picture emergency managers with several screens in front of them and having the data they need at their fingertips to make decisions very quickly so that we get the heck out of one another's way, right? We stay in our lanes, but we're also providing valuable input to one another to create success for one another. So I see that. I, I was telling Tom, I, I test drove a a car not too long ago and and in the windshield was the speedometer and the uh, gas gauge and and what I thought was pretty neat about that was I had the instrumentation I needed in front of me and I was able to be conscious of what my vehicle was doing even though it's not my vehicle but I was conscious of the status of the vehicle but at the same time, I didn't have to take my eyes off of the road. So that's what these dashboards are all about. They keep us focused on the mission, but they also put all the data in front of us so that we can make decisions without taking our focus off of the end result. So uh, get involved. This is Maybe one of the biggest crowds I've seen in the last uh, five years. I, I certainly hope every chair is, is filled the next time, Bill. That's just not a, a ploy to, or, or, or a pitch to be back here. But I hope every seat, wherever we are, is filled the next time. So tell a few friends, uh, take advantage of the, the presentations, and uh, by all means, get involved. You can, you can call me. You can call Tom. You can send us an email and say, I'd really like to get involved. How can I do that? Um, so and we'd be more than more than happy to help. Okay, now before we leave, I do have one last thing I have got to do, or I will never hear the end of it, and that is Puerto Rico. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay it out there for us this way. That I'll, I promise I'll I'll say goodbye. Um, Puerto Rico, we heard about 89 percent or 86 percent of the transmission system system being. Uh, 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 out or, or destroyed or affected in some way. 87% of the, Mike, I'm not getting these right, but I'm close. I know you know it. It's always been your slide and you do damn good with it. Um, but, but, but pretty much I would call uh, Puerto Rico a catastrophe. I would call that a catastrophic situation with everything up in the 80s. I'm curious. And, and 
please participate as openly as you like. Um, what is catastrophic to you and what you do? What, what is that number for you and your organization? Is it 80%? Is it 80% of the transmission system damaged? 80% of the trucks being stuck on the highway? I don't know. Does anybody have any ideas of what catastrophic means to them and their sector? Really, I, there's a lot at stake here. I'm never going to hear the end of it. Someone's got to give me an answer because somebody is listening to me on the phone. And so can, can, you, can you help me out? Perfect. Six weeks of no power in Pennsylvania. Okay, very good. Anybody else? What is catastrophic to you? Correct. No internet. Okay, what else? For how long? Major damage to generation. Anyone else? What about telecommunications? Sorry, just I'm 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 searching for answers here. I will be a You made this well worth it. Anybody else? I missed my 4:30. <laughs> <laughs> one more, one more, one more. I would say, from a private sector perspective, if your margins are low, one to two percent, you know, could be catastrophic. Okay. Also, the other one for the bank. Yeah, for banking. So the day, one day of banking inability. Yeah. I'm glad that's not my home because I'd be in catastrophic conditions almost <laughs> daily, but thank you. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Please, wherever you're traveling to, get back to where you belong safely. And John, I hope you're happy with that. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much again. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to get to it. I was like, okay. No. <laughs> so, so, like, do you have questions? I do appreciate this. I talked to the head of Car Carnegie Mellon when we were trying to do this. Essentially, they have, they have no idea about the banking industry. They have the head of the Federal Reserve, the head of Carnegie Mellon, and they had the international heads across the globe figuring out what's going on with the U.S. because they couldn't make their Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anyhow, you can see what I'm doing. We'll right no, 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 we'll check. I, we, uh, you, you, you probably should uh, chime in with the size work group. If, if I, as a, as a, if you could learn from them, and I think they could certainly learn from you. The one thing that you should know is everything that you're doing. Absolutely. Oh, perfect. 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 No. So like everything like when you look at this, first this is a level lower level transaction, which means you don't have to do an in person proofing. Right, right, right. It gives you an option of tokens that you can use. My 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 best educator for that was five years on the PCWG and then actually doing a PIMI pilot for state company. And that was the end of that. So let me, but that was good. It was good. It, it got it gave me process, it gave us a lot of things. So let me ask you, how you doing? Yeah. We'll get together. We'll, we'll do that, right. but I just you, you look good. You look I'm back awesome. on my own again. I left in I'm on my own, so you look good. I feel great. Yeah. We'll have to get together. You tell me how the boys right. are doing. Ah. All right. I see the pictures, you know? <laughs> okay, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom, Tom. Hey, Jay. Tom. How are you? Sorry, I was going to say, I have not. I've heard. I've heard I don't think we've met before. Have I think we talked on the phone. I talked on the yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I said, so. I don't know this man. So, okay. <laughs> and I came in awesome. late. You know, awesome. Awesome. Great. Uh, so Good. Sorry I was late, but I was like, no, no. picking up here. So, no. so it worked out. I mean, I wanted to get for the whole day, but luckily when I had the curveball thrown to me, it was up in Wilmington. Right. So I'm like, hey, I'm 20 minutes away there. So Let me give you my card, AJ, in case you need anything.
<coughs> so we just yeah, think we, we just huddle for a half hour. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I gotta look at the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. So I got a, I think I got a, a butterfly on the San Fran. So. Okay. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm gonna stay over. You're I'm staying over? Take a late, late afternoon flight on uh, the next, next day. day. I just, if I'm gonna be out there, I'm gonna have maybe have a day of downtime. Sure. Well, City. City, um, bench. Yeah. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna book that. Yeah. Do you normally go out for a, what do I, and like all of that, or do I? The whole shebang. Okay. Uh, receptions, uh, <coughs> we have, uh, Steve Lewis in the news at the, uh, yeah, it's all that. You guys sign up for that? Food Alley, or whatever it's called. Yeah. Or, uh, okay. That, that comes with your registration. And, um, well, no, that was that's like seventy five dollars. Oh, maybe it's different. Yeah. That one is, yeah. yeah. Well, you don't have to go to that. But, uh, I'm sure you still think it's well, totally fine. Right? <laughs> my my uh, wife might not. Yeah, you should go. It's nice out there, and uh, yeah. she's gonna. You had a lot of uh, you had a lot of time away from her. You had a lot of time with her. Hopefully, <coughs> I won't be there. Um, well, I think we have to confirm that the. The oldest is going to be home from college. Oh, okay. So once we confirm he's going to be home, then we'll just let like them survive on their own. Hopefully that will be, be okay. intact. There'll be, okay. There'll, be okay. There'll be one left. They haven't <laughs> burnt my house down yet. They're like, yeah, they need rules. I go, what's, what's my big rule? Don't burn the house down. Yeah, oh, that's pretty okay. easy. Yeah, it's pretty high bar. We get it, though. <laughs> you know, See, your kids are there for a while. My son, he's still took care of the house. I have look at I have zero. How old is he? Okay. But I expect his after is probably a couple of uh, pretty good parties at my house <laughs> yeah. while I was gone. Especially like the Christmas, New Year's, Super Bowl. <laughs> it's like I 
You got my card, right? Yeah. Okay. I put a set of glasses up here. I'm not sure whose they were. Not mine. Mine are on my Yours are on your head. Um, are you heading that right away? 